What up, people? Guy and Tommy here. It's Thursday, the 23rd of February. It's the last Thursday in February. As it turns out, I didn't realize it, but yesterday was the last Wednesday in February. The month went by like that. I'm happy I was able to snap my fingers. Uh, this market call, Dan, brought to you by our presenting sponsors, SoFi. I love saying this. Get your money right all in one app. And of course, FactSet Financial Data and Analytics powered by tomorrow. FactSet is also our data provider. In a brief a few minutes, and a few minutes is typically brief, EY from SoFi, who is currently on with the SDs on the IC, but she will be joining us, I guess, from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange or Parts Unknown. Uh, she will be joining. Do not ask me what an SD from the IC is. I refuse to answer. Interesting day here, Dan. Uh, I mentioned we're going to talk about Ranger Hockey. They played Detroit tonight. I think this is an important game, but you don't give a shit. I know. How are you today? You know, I, I do care. No, you don't, Dan. I just don't care on the market call. You know, you know what I mean? Um, no, it's, listen, I care all the time. Market call, OTT. I mean, I'm immersed in Ranger Hockey. You you are that. Um, we're go we are going to a Ranger game Stop next it. week together. You 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 and I, just the two of us. No, well, it's, no, it's uh, not just the two of us. It's gonna be a group of people. Yeah, it's going to be excellent. Um, all right, let, let's talk about the S&P 500 here, man. Like big reversal intraday. I mean, and that's one thing. It was interesting. So this week, we saw the, the largest down day of 2023. That was two days ago, right? The S&P was down 2%. The NASDAQ was down 2.5%. I'm looking at the SPX on my fact set machine. Yeah, you are. We traded as high as 40.28 this morning. We traded as low as 39.70 um, that's a pretty good 60 ish. Almost 60 point. handles. Yes, 60. I can do that math. Handles, as they say in the biz. Uh, so I don't know. What was the cause? I, I woke up this morning, early this morning, and I saw a headline futures up as equity investors get in line or get aligned with like the rates market or this. Yeah. I was like, that's the dumbest headline. Like, why would why would the futures be up if they are going to get in line with what's going on with rates? The, the, the market's going to be down a lot, guy. And I know, all right, am I speaking to my dogma, as you might say, a little bit? Sure. But like the idea that we have a Fed funds rate that's going to be pinned above 5% in the not so distant future. And to your point that you made on numerous occasions, if it goes well below 5% anytime soon, when the Fed raises above that level, it's not going to be for good reasons. And it's not going to be equity market friendly. A lot of strange things. And listen, first of all, the people that write those headlines for whatever publication or, you know, channel, I mean, they typically, you know, they don't know as, as they used to say, they wouldn't know preferred stock from livestock, which is one of the great lines, by the way, of the great movie yeah. Wall Street. I just love that movie. It's so quotable. But I digress a bit. I mean, I think to a large part, I think the whole move higher today was predicated on the fact that NVIDIA, and we'll talk about NVIDIA in a second, is just going sort of ballistic here. So I think people got themselves all juiced up, and I think the broader market took its cues from that obviously coming off of a pretty significant sell-off. So the bounce, I guess, made sense. The reversal is something you have to sort of bookmark. We talk about this all the time. A few times a year, maybe more than a few times a year, you get these days where you have to pay attention to what's going on. So the reversal today is something to keep it in consideration. Again, a market that had every reason to rally today and did early, should have held, did not. We'll see how the day closes out. But this is one of those days you want to watch really closely. And I'll just sort of say this. Apple was lower long before the broader market was lower, which is a bit of a tell. You actually brought it up in a conversation we had a few hours ago. So a lot of cross currents out there. Obviously, the bond market's still front and center. We have an inflation number tomorrow that I'm sure everybody's keyed up about. And you can to have these Fed officials to come out and talk about as hawkishly as they have for quite some time. So we'll yeah. see how it shakes itself out is my want to say. Yeah, so I want to hit this tweet from uh, David Rosenberg. Please, Rosenberg. I love Rosie. Research. We call him Rosie. <laughs> yeah, no, this is good. I mean, we've been talking about the kind of like just the change in sentiment that went from um, a hard landing. Remember last uh, late spring, summer, you know, guys like Jamie Dimon were talking about an economic hurricane yeah, that sure. was coming. Then that kind of, you know, kind of like I think it crescendoed a little bit into the October lows. Um, and then we got to this kind of soft landing narrative towards the end of the year. 
And then somehow it just maybe it's just the kind of the price of equities or at least the, the major indices um, got a lot of people off sides, in my opinion, thinking that there was going to be some sort of no landing. I don't even know what the heck that is. The no landing narrative is the biggest hoax Wall Street economists have peddled since the global decoupling in 08. Follow the leading indicators, says Rosie, not yeah. Pied Pipers. What is a Pied Piper guy? It's, you know, it's somebody that stands on the front of the line and plays like a flute or some sort of uh, yeah. leered like, in you know, um, woodwind type of instrument. Or perhaps yeah. a flute is a non-woodwind and they lead people to various places. Sometimes they lead them astray. I'll go back to the great movie Poseidon Adventure, if you recall, Gene Hackman, Gene Hackman played yeah. a preacher. And he was a bit of a Pied Piper trying to lead people up because the boat was upside down and everybody was going down. And he tried to tell those folks, hey, you're going the wrong effing way. Well, yeah. Shelly Winters followed him. She subsequently drowned. And Ernest Borgnine followed him as well. I can continue this if you want. But the point is, Pied Piper is somebody that people follow. And in terms of this no landing bullshit, yeah. I don't know who the asshole is that came up with it. But it's clearly somebody that's trying to make a name for him or herself. It's just dumb. It's just so. St oh, I got instead of soft landing. It's how about no landing? How about you go f yourself? Back to you, Dan. Whoa, you, you got. Yeah, well, it's just you got a little X or it's size dumb. here. It's I think a lot of people. I think dumb. a lot of people tune into the the program here because they love to see guy. Well, you know, because on fast money you do bleep. That's what you say. You bleep yeah. Well, I people. have to do that. No, I know. I just think you enjoy. Uh, you haven't said the F word, and that's good. I think that the no, FCC I wouldn't say that here. I do that on other be, things, but might not, not here. let us be here. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think the Rosie thing. You know, listen, I love that guy. I mean, like wh whatever you think. I mean, the perma this, perma that. You know, that people get it on both sides um, here. I think that you know, like we know this. Most economists who are speaking to market participants generally have a rosy outlook uh you see what oh, i did there, there right yeah. um or looking through rose color glasses um rosy is there to kind of pick apart i think the universal um you know bullishness that exists whether the markets are up a lot or whether they're down a lot i mean it's just that simple i like his work um let's look at the s p 500 and real guys. quick yes i do as well and you know when you get labeled like tony dwyer for example when he yeah. was bullish and correct you thought tony's always bullet well it's not true you know, Tony's now bearish. He came on Fast Money the other night. He did a podcast with you. So yep. people, it's just, everybody wants to be quick to label. We get labeled. I get it. You know, it's it's unfortunate, but that's just the reality because I think inherently people are lazy. Anyway, let's take a look at the S&P. Well, I mean, listen, I think inherently um, a lot of people who are watching the content that we do on TV or they follow you on the Twitter or they're watching Market Call or listening on the tape, I mean, oftentimes people are not going to get the totality of our work. And I think that one of the things that you and I like to say is we like to be, um, you know, really transparent. We're talking every day about this stuff. So you could cherry pick anything you want. I mean, in this business, you know, um, we talked about emotion yesterday, you know, like, you know, the, the kind of some of the fallacies about trading or investing. You can't be emotional. You got to take the emotion out of it, this and that, whatever. All that stuff is, is in this. And when we think about how you and I kind of, talk about markets we talk about what we're doing in the markets that sort of thing i mean listen we reserve the right to change our mind and you know this was one let's just actually let's go to this tweet and and maybe uh somebody mark uh erlandson uh he tweeted at us guy you, know Nvidia, you men certainly took a swing and miss about yeah, yeah. it well, i responded to that i know but i just want to say this is like okay we're commentators man i mean like you know i had something to say um you know we got you know, maybe a coin flip of being right and, and all the nuance and this and that, whatever, you know, we will tell you if we have a position, if we're trading it, if we're long it, short it, this and that, whatever. I don't remember saying anything about a position I took and I'm not trying to divorce myself from like what I said. That quarter was fine. That guidance was fine. Does it deserve 12 and a half percent on a five? hundred billion dollar market cap guy you tell me no and so if you want to kind of cherry pick some of the thoughts that we had whether it be on fast money or here or whatever the hell you want that's fine dude that's on you man i mean like as far as i'm concerned like like we're just kind of telling what this stock could have easily easily been down 10 percent on that quarter and the guidance that they gave guys so you know i mentioned first of all again and i responded to that i said i can only speak for myself and i was wrong i would have felt really badly about myself if i had come on and said you know stay with nvidia here it looks great the momentum blah 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 and they came out 
And basically, in, the in quarter would have been interpreted differently. Instead of being up 12%, it was down. Because quite frankly, the, the valuation does not merit this current stock price. Again, just my opinion. But I was wrong. That's fine. You know what? In, in retrospect, if I had to do it over again, I probably would say the same exact thing because it's a disciplined thing to say. Let me just point this out. And, and I mentioned it last night. I think in terms of earnings, NVIDIA was down 33% year over year. And I think revenue was like in the 20s down year over year. And the stock's the same price as it was last. 225, 230 is the exact same level we were a year ago today. So you make your own conclusions. Now, Karen pointed out that interest rate, yeah, I get it. A lot of things have changed over the course of a year. You know what hasn't changed? The fact that now the stock is really freaking expensive trading north of 50 times earnings and probably now close to 19 times or so revenue. Now, if you believe that they're on the cusp of this AI thing and they're going to be the, you know what, as you say, have at it people, valuations won't matter because they'll grow into it. I've heard that argument before, but this is a stock that I think it right now is sort of divorced itself from reality. And you're going to have a day today where it probably trades north of three times normal volume. So we'll see how this one shakes out. Yeah, well, I'll just say this. Um, you know, I said it last night when we were looking at the numbers and the guidance as they came out, you know, and I read a couple quotes from their press release. Jensen Wang, he talked about how um, AI is at an inflection point. I mean, he seemed about as hypey as you can get. And then he went on to say that our chip for AI is, you know, and, and their transformer, it, th this thing is in full production. So, you know, and our friend Doug Cass mentioned this uh in an email i think to you and me maybe while we we're on the set or maybe this morning um you know echoing exactly what i said on the show last night i mean these guys went from gaming to bitcoin mining to every other buzzy thing and now you know they're back open for business um as it relates to to this later latest hype thing so you know that is what it is i mean have at it as as you would say i think this stock probably fills in that gap i'm just going to say that right now i'm actually looking at put spreads maybe like the 230 190 put spread in march something like that so 40 wide i'll pay less than uh 25 of the width of that guy how's that as a trade let me I'll I'm going to mock that up as we uh, mock as it we, up as we so talk. Hey, before about we it. bring in EY from SoFi, LMX just said, um, "Guy, Microsoft gave bad guidance, and you're bearish on the stock." True. Nvidia gives good guidance, and you're bearish on it. Well, it's for, my my bearishness in Nvidia is for completely different reasons. I mean, if it was only on guidance, then we'd have a conversation. Microsoft, I was bearish on because of the guidance, because of the things you heard from Satya Nadella. And because, quite frankly, it, it was an expensive stock as well. NVIDIA is just ridiculously expensive. And the guidance was fine. It, there's not, you know, it's fine. But it, it, that guidance, to, to me, is not supportive of the 13% move on top of a 100% move, effectively, that we've seen since the fall. So that's my only point about NVIDIA. But I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Should we bring in EY from yeah, SoFi? Yeah, you want to chat I love, about I love else? her. I love, I, I love LY from SoFi. We're going to bring her in a second. No, EY. But I just want to – I just want so the stock right here is 234, okay? So it's back at that high that we just made, if they could pull up the chart. Um, it, it's finding – you know, it did break out a little bit. It's trading at a level that it has not traded at, guys, since April of 2021. And, you know, you just made the point about interest rates. I mean, um, again, you know, the growth rates are similar – um, the stock is probably more expensive in a higher rate environment. Um, to me, I just think that, you know, when estimates now, or at least expectations are higher than they probably should be given what I think is going to happen in the economy, I'm looking at the 230 to 190, uh, put spread, you pay about $8 and 80 cents for that. So that's less than 25% of the width. That's not a bad looking, uh, put spread there, uh, you know, pays basically three to one, uh, on that guy, but you have until March 17th. So about you know, three and a half. You got weeks. a couple of weeks here. I mean, yeah. you got to, I, personally, I like that. Your Microsoft trade worked out really well. And by the way, the setup, and again, now I'm completely off the rails, but the setup here in NVIDIA is eerily similar to the setup in Facebook post the Facebook earnings when it traded huge volume, traded between 183 and 188 over the course of a couple of days and created this little island, which by the way, is still intact. So we'll see. Anyway, yeah, that's I just like clear. I'm going to start buying actually the the March 17th 230 200 put spread. It cost uh 790 or something like that. So again, I like the risk reward there. Um, that's that's what I'm looking at. Um, all right, should we do it, guy? Well, why not? Now I'm going to say this. Bring her in, and as as I say this, you know, this uh, is you know this is going to be somewhat um self-serving. Nice outfit, by the way. 
Um, but I'm convinced that we're at a point in our relationship where you sit there, and I've mentioned a hundred times in your feety pajamas, thinking of titles that are just going to aggravate the shit out of me. And I would say 90% of the time, if not greater, you're successful in that. Hello, EY from SoFi. From the floors of the New York Stock Exchange, where you just appeared with some of the ICs from the um, SDs, some of the yeah, SDs yeah, from the ICs. I, I lose. You got you got your own nickname wrong. Yeah, that's bad. Look, guys, I don't know Hello. what happened on this show before I came in, but the comments tell me that guy had a meltdown. No, required, not at all. Not no meltdown. Dan, somebody called Dan a lyrical miracle. So mm, what, did you break into song? Well, I don't know what went on here. I got to make sure I'm here on time. This is exciting. So Scott show the halftime report, which you are a, 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 uh, a member of the IC um, is now always going to be broadcast for the New York stock exchange. That's pretty cool. That's right. Yeah, that's that right. Work, yeah, that works well for you from from a, a downtown <laughs> New York city. <laughs> works great for me. It doesn't work great for the people who live in Jersey and Long Island, but yeah. I live in the city. I work in the city, so yeah, this is great for me. And I get to come into this studio that Kramer used to use, and they didn't leave those buttons though. I need his sound effects. You need. You, I wish I could buttons. use those. She needs buttons. Um, Liz, yeah. what, what do you think about? Up? What do you think about the reversal today? Um, you know, <sighs> we were talking a little bit about. Like, okay, so the market stabilized a little bit after that that bad Tuesday that we had, right? And now here we are. That's a pretty sharp, you know, 50, 60 point, you know, handle drop in the S&P 500. Carter's been showing us on the market call a little work saying we broke that uptrend from the October lows um, here a little bit, or actually from the lows this year. Thoughts here on the, on the, on the equity market? So there's a couple things, rules of thumb that I keep in my head and I just watch this, especially after a big down day like Tuesday. Expect if people had buying appetite and if this was actually the beginning of a new uptrend that we would have had more of a rebound on Wednesday and we didn't really. It was uninspiring at best for most of the day and then obviously finished mostly down and the NASDAQ was up marginally. And then today, this reversal, this tells me that we've lost momentum on the upside. I posted a tweet yesterday about us kind of approaching a lot of these decision points in the S&P where we're gonna either break down through some of these lines or we're gonna break above it. And that's really gonna tell you how much appetite investors have for taking on risk at these price levels. Again, my gut tells me that these price levels are not the right time to be taking on more risk. So I think that giving some of the January rally back is the smart thing to do. And we have to reprice in all of the uncertainty that's still out there. But here's the thing. I'm right now feeling probably more short term than I ever usually do. I don't usually speak in short term uh, statements, but you have to look at it over almost a 30 to 45 day period. And I would say we're in kind of this in between in the meantime market until there's a catalyst that takes us, my bet is to the downside, but we just haven't had one yet. And I think people assume that we've priced in all of and, and digested all of the rate hikes because they're in the Fed futures, but I don't think they're in the equity market yet. Now, you, you, said, you said, it's interesting, people say you said something really important and that's, that comment in and of itself suggests that the rest of the stuff you say is not important. <laughs> I would say you always say important things, but I think it was three or four weeks ago, you said when Dan and I were, again, the market was rallying and we were questioning some of this stuff, you said, you went to some of your mentors. You didn't include Dan and me, by the way. Oh, but you went to your mentors and they said, stay with your work, stay with the process. And by the way, I think within a day or two, that proved to be the top of this, you know, the rally we've seen. And yep. that I think is an important, I, I want to bring that up because it's important to stay with the process. People, you know, pr tr price has a way of changing the narrative. And I understand that. But if you stay with the process and if your process is sound, Things seem to work themselves out. And as we're sitting here today on the back of his pretty significant sell off yesterday, the fact that we've reversed lower today, and I mentioned it before you got here, this is one of those days that I think we'll come back in a few weeks and say that sell off on the Thursday, that reversal was really an important day. And, you know, I'm looking at Alibaba, which reported earnings, and a few people have mentioned the comments reversing lower. You know, I mentioned Apple was sort of leading us lower. So, a lot of these cross currents, EY, are sort of sh completely lining up with a lot of the stuff you've been saying over the last few weeks. Yeah, and so there's there's another rule of thumb, and, and nobody write this down and hold me to it, but it's just one of those things that you kind of, what the gut feeling. So when the market is down, when the S&P is down three days in a row, if it's 
in an otherwise upward sloping pattern, usually on the fourth day, you see a positive result. That is not what happened this time. So that tells me now if this would be the fifth day in a row that we'd be down, that tells me momentum on the upside has, has left the building, so to speak. And what my mentors said to me, one of them in particular said, I think you're being too hard on yourself, right? That you're worried about being wrong here and that it, it, things are not going your way. Again, stick to it, wait it out. You know that things always overshoot on both the up and the down. So maybe we overshot a little bit on the upside and you do have to kind of wait it out. And look, here's something I've done over the past 30 days. I've sat with myself maybe once a week and said, okay, I'm going to try. I'm going to do what I can to pretend in my own head to make the bull case. I'm going to go and make a statement and I'm going to try to really get behind it and feel good about it. I run out of reasons for the bull case after about one or two bullet points and I don't feel good about it. And it's re the reality is I try to be responsible about what I tell people to put their money to work in. And I don't want to tell them to put money to work in stuff that I'm pretty sure is going to go down. One last anecdote, I will say, I got asked to speak uh, at an event, I believe it's in April, mid-April sometime. And it would be me and one other strategist, well-known strategist in the space. And the idea was to have us face off against each other. So obviously this other strategist is more bullish, right? And I said, sure, I'll do it. By April though, mm -hmm. I might be right. And you might look wrong, right? So are you sure that you still, <laughs> you still want me to do that? I think that we're in decision time over the next 30 to 60 days. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. You know, one of the things that I think um, is kind of emerging of late, and especially as interest rates have pushed higher, the 10-year um, at, you know, three or uh, yeah, three point nine percent or so, and and your point about you know Fed funds being anchored, you know about five percent. Um, at least that's what Fed funds futures are showing. Look at some of the data. Look at some of the guidance we're seeing from some of these. Um, just this week from some of these you know consumer facing um, companies. T today, guy, the Dollar General, and this is yeah. one that you've tracked, and it's really interesting. The Dollar General was about to make a new fifty two week high right as the stock market was making lows in October. And, and since then, it's down about 17%. Pretty nasty breakdown here on a miss, uh, a revenue miss. You know, we saw what Home Depot had to say. We saw what Walmart had to say. It was interesting that Walmart, you know, this was on Tuesday, um, you know, had kind of recouped some of those early losses and closed up on the day. Well, it's been the next two trading days, you know, giving all of that back if they could throw um, the Walmart um, chart up there. And then this is one guy that you flagged and I think we're going to talk about it on Fast Money tonight. Look at this uh, this Domino's, mm -hmm. this DPD. And, and, you know, this is also something we've been talking about, some of these kind of staples, consumer product companies. I mean, that is a textbook head and shoulder top there. And their guidance was not particularly good. And I think some of these companies are getting to a point where all of these issues with wages and, and higher input costs is just higher. It's just harder at this stage of the game with rates where they are, with consumer savings going down, with with credit going up, you know, or at least uh, personal credit, you know, the, the numbers, they're not able to pass through. And then the other one, pull up Netflix here. Um, Netflix is lowering prices. Now, this is not in the U.S., but they've just instituted price increases. This was last year in the U.S. They also are adding this ad-supported model, but they are lowering prices in other parts of the world. So I think it's becoming harder and harder for some of these companies to pass through increased costs. It's interesting. It was the guidance in Dollar Gen that scared people. And to your point, you know, that got which basically... At the lower end, they cut in half their EPS growth guidance, which is significant. And, you know, that comes down to your point, margins. They can, these companies can no longer, it's seemingly, they can no longer pass on these costs to the consumer. And when that happens, what happens, margins contract and you start to lose it on the EPS side of the equation. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing it across a swath of companies. And that's the next iteration, Right. Companies can pass on costs until they can't. That's not to me that meant to be glib. It's just true. I mean, a number of companies have been able to do it successfully, and then you get to that point where they no longer can. And that's seemingly where we are, and that's going to start to cut into margins, which cut into earnings, which theoretically should cut into the valuation or the basically the multiple you pay for these earnings, EY. Yeah, I don't yeah, think Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and I don't and look, it's, it's right kind now. of – oh, am I not here? I'm you're here. back. You're back. You you're back. You got me. Yeah. Okay. We got you. Um, it, so the term of the week is the equity risk premium, right? And a lot of that is you're not really getting compensated to take on that risk. And a lot of the risk that you'd be taking on right now 
is earnings risk. And and look, earnings revisions have happened and everything's come down. The, the peak expectation for 2023 was $252 a share. So we're down about 13%. And that's good. That's not revision downward, but it's better than, you know, being lofty about it. I still think they come down further. And I think that companies have a really hard time managing their margins in an environment like this, where revenues are falling rapidly because inflation is falling and the consumer is trading down. The consumer is deciding and being a little more choosy about where they're going to spend those dollars. So then that's where you see face-offs between stores like Target and Walmart, right? Target is slightly more expensive than Walmart. If Target gets hurt in this environment, Walmart probably benefits from Target getting hurt, right? So you look at some of those patterns that are going to start to occur, and I think they're going to be a lot more clear as we get into late spring and early summer when people realize that, you know what, I've got all this credit card debt piling up. I took out a personal loan to pay off my credit card debt, and the rate on that personal loan is pretty high. I'm worried about it. I can't spend money like I used to, and then things change. But it's not here yet, and that's just the reality. All right, let's talk about your note this morning. I thought it was really interesting, Liz, because you start out by saying this one may be a bit more short-term oriented than normal here. Um, and so this is on the SoFi.com investing blog, so you guys could check it out. You can check out um, the blog on our Twitter at market call, MRKT call, and obviously at Liz Young Strat. So check it out, subscribe to her newsletter so you get it in your email box and then you're always gonna hear her Thursday to talk about it. But this one was interesting. You're talking about just kind of the some of the components of the rally that we had year to date. And I do think it's interesting and and, and I want you to kind of break down what you're seeing, but you know, the s and P's up only 4% right now, a little less than 4%. The NASDAQ's down, uh, you know, up a little bit less than 10%. I mean, these were, you know, they've given back at least half their gains, um, you know, from uh, from their highs here. So talk to us about what your take was, was on the, like, I guess the, the makeup of the rally and where you think it's going on a short-term basis. I know you, you hit that a little bit, but some of the data that you have in your note. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I would mention too is we gave back the rally in the stock market. Look at what happened in JNK. February month to date, it's down about 3.2%. So maybe it's starting to finally bleed into the corporate credit market as well. This chart, it looks dramatic, but that's on purpose, right? It's showing you what happened in 2022. So the worst performing sectors of 2022 actually turned into the best performing sectors of 2023, almost in perfect pattern, right? And that tells you that it was mostly rate driven. If you think, and you have to oversimplify this stuff sometimes, what happened in 2022 was rate driven on the downside. What I think the rally we saw in 2023 so far has been is rate driven, but on the upside in the equity market. So the piece is titled Splitsville. The trends went in different directions. There are a couple things, there are indicators that are moving in different directions. There's another chart in this piece. If we have it on here, bring it up. Otherwise you can just, there it is, perfect. You knew I was gonna say that. This one I think is really interesting. And Guy, I know you talk about this all the time. This is the relationship between the 10-year yield and cyclical stocks. Now, if 10-year yields are rising, usually that means economic boom. That means good things for growth are coming. You see the 10-year yield here has spiked up and cyclical stocks have sort of stayed at the bottom. They're kind of muddling along. So here's the thing where I think the equity market actually did sniff this out correctly and continues to sniff this out correctly. Yields are not up for good reasons. Yields are not up because cyclicals should come back or because we're in the beginning of a new cyclical bull market or a cyclical expansion in the economy. And I think the equity market, I, th I said in my piece, I think the equity market is right as rain about that. There is still a reason to be skeptical here. These lines likely have to come back together. And the question mark remains, which one has to move the most? I love that. It's fantastic. I'm I'm so happy you brought that up because rates are not going higher because things are so rosy. Rates going higher for the wrong reasons. And this chart illustrates exactly that. A couple things um, in no particular order. Since you mentioned Splitsville, in your cheerleading time when you <laughs> dated the quarterback, were you able to do a split? I never dated the quarterback. Yeah, you did. I think he was a defensive player I went oh, to prom okay. with. Sorry I think he was on that. defense. He's a big guy. Uh, no, I was no. not a, no, no. There was a lot of jumping. Uh, there was a lot, we did a lot of gymnastics, but no, none of that stuff. That Fair was enough. more like and a dance team thing. Now I we like the state, way, you, you, by the way, it was a when what? I was a cheerleader, we won state, we won the state cheerleading championship. 
course Twice while I was on varsity. Yeah. I was, I was, I was, yeah. And you appeared in Wizard of Oz. So, I mean, you had it all, all the bases <laughs> covered. Uh, next question. I mean, I see what you did. See, balloons are all in the news, and you decided to bring in one of the titles, Up, Up, and Away, of course, a song from the, I believe it was the Fifth Dimension back in the 60s, In My Beautiful Balloon, well done by you. Uh, it's right on, by, I believe it was Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr., Dan. Dan is like, okay, I'm done with you now. Anyway, back to you, Dan. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, listen, that was a great note. <laughs> you know, that was a great note. <laughs> you know where to find it. Um, guy, anything sticking out to you? I just want to hit one one other thing. You know, we've been talking um, about geopolitical stuff here and there. And, yeah. so, you know, the situation, obviously, it feels like in, in Ukraine is going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, it feels like the just the temperature um, with us in China is just getting dialed up here. It seems that, you know, the Taiwanese are sending some of their troops, um, you know, here to be trained. Uh, this is this is not great. And so when we think about, you know, I'm not one of these doomers when it comes to I think most most geopolitical things, you know, end up working themselves out dipl diplomatically. Right. And I don't really it's not on my bingo card that we're going to be in some sort of, you know, kind of shooting war with China anytime soon. All that being said, I mean, any any sort of embargoes that go on, whether they be economic, whether they be militarily of Taiwan and there's some disruption with supply chains. I mean, we're sitting here looking at the SMH up two and a half percent, largely because what's going on in NVIDIA, AMD's up in sympathy, Taiwan semis up in sympathy here. But to me, man, I, I feel like the semi thing has the potential to maybe make look what's going on because of Ukraine, Russia with energy really bad i mean like like it could be like that it could look like just make it look like like a non-event like what could happen with look, i mean I, yes i am not a doomsday or you know we don't want these things to happen but you read the tea leaves and what i mean in a word what we're seeing is an escalation on pretty much on both sides by the way and nobody seems to want to back off right now and there's no detente and i to your point the Russia-Ukraine thing, unfortunately, probably continues to get worse before it gets better, if at all. And you know, U.S.-China relations are probably as frosty as they've been since pre-Nixon administration. And I remember those days, believe it or not. So yeah, both are vying for economic um, superiority. I mean, both have a lot at stake here. The reason it's one of the things that scares me, though, and I've said this a number of times, is that I think the Chinese are willing to lose battles to win war. And we're not sort of set up that way. So the unfortunate reality is I think the, the rhetoric will continue. Yeah. Liz, real quickly, um, when you think about, you know, th those, that sort of setup that we just gave, let's just say there was some sort of um, something happened um, with China and Taiwan. You know, the, the Fed's playbook would, would likely be to lower interest rates, right? So we talk about the sort of things that could cause the Fed to kind of get off script as it relates to battling inflation. That might be one that they would do, right? If there was, But the idea that supply chains get disrupted and we have shortages of essential goods that's the very thing that they've actually been raising rates, right, to combat. It, it's a really difficult situation. I think the Fed, their toolbox was not built for like macro or, or, or you know, geopolitical sort of issues. So, you know, I, I'm just saying, is there anything that you see out there that could cause the Fed to change their view on their rate stance right now? No, frankly. And, and I think, you know, even if something did erupt between China and Taiwan, I don't think the Fed cuts rates unless it's something that sends ripples through global financial markets and makes markets stop functioning how they should. And I, I'm stressing that last point because, look, if there was an event, would the market go down? Yeah, probably. Does that mean the Fed cuts rates? No, absolutely not. And I don't think that they should in that environment, because if it's an event geopolitically, that is, like you said, is going to disrupt supply chains or is going to kind of send shock waves of fear throughout financial markets, leaving inflation where it is, is mm -hmm. not the answer, right? So I don't think they would cut rates in that, in that scenario. And I think that it would be a time where a couple of rude awakenings would occur. First of which is that it would be an event that we weren't really prepared for uh, anywhere around the globe, right? We're prepared for the consumer to weaken. We're not prepared for a war to break out in Asia. The other thing that I think it would do is that it would ruin our muscle memory for thinking that the Fed can just save everything. The Fed is not going to come in and save everything when its dual mandate is not solved. So it would it would be a rude awakening. I think it would be a tough slog for markets for a while. And something that I've mentioned 
on this show before, equity markets right now are priced for like a regular correction, mm -hmm. right? Since their highs, they're priced for one of those annual oopsie daisies. We had a little pullback. An event like that is not a regular correction scenario. So we would go down pretty quickly and I think pretty dramatically. Dan, what do you put in a toolbox? Tools. <laughs> On that note, um, I want to thank EY from SoFi for joining us. Her participation is always looked forward to. You know, Thursdays are a day that I look forward to regardless. But, you know, her on Thursdays just makes it that much better. Of course, we got Ranger Hockey tonight, as I mentioned, playing the Red Wings. There's a huge, apparently, um, cold swath growing through the Midwest. So for you Wisconsin yes. folk out there, you know warm you know get your blankets not just cold and, snowy sleet all yeah, the good stuff that should that. be happening in winter like my, like my dad says it's called winter it happens every year I yeah love you. I that, mean, that sounds like such a guy man. expression there we should add a, 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 a weather segment and, and, and a uh, sports segment and then we'll just have the the, the midday news here like can we get your man channel. on market seriously can we get him on market call not, one of not if you want to keep it to 30 minutes i mean that's that's a 90 minute show and no shit time. i'll do that i'd love that it'd be a fucking ball uh thank you ey uh from the new york stock exchange from jim kramer's old set fantastic i love the note you know where to find her we don't have to go into it anymore find her work it's absolutely a must read dan and i both do i want to thank uh fact set financial data and analytics powered by tomorrow they are our data provider and sofi of course dan get your money right in all in one application i think they call it an app i like to say the word though because it's a fun word to say I am leaving uh, my basement, headed to New York City for CNBC's Fast Money tonight. Should be fun. Dan, you want to sort of close this out? Yeah, let's close this out. Guys, thanks for being here. Liz, <laughs> see, see you soon. Guy Dami, I'll see you on Fast Money later. Later, people. Bring thanks. the energy. See you later. Thanks.